All right, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Um, so welcome uh, to uh, what's going to be a wonderful evening uh, with uh, Arnold Donald. Um, I want to just uh, remind you of uh, a couple of uh, things before we get to uh, our distinguished speaker for the evening. So please uh, recall that um, Alex Villick is going to be here on uh, September 24th. Uh, we certainly don't want to miss uh, this one. Uh, all about you know digital tran digital transformation in the uh, uh, newspaper world, uh, and then uh, just to remind you that uh, what we're doing here tonight and every night we have these events is uh, bringing only the best uh, to uh, Miami, and we have a whole series of uh, events over the next uh, seven months already booked, as many of you will know. Now, before we uh, introduce uh, uh, our speaker this evening. Uh, I just want to allude to uh, uh, this, particular, this particular advertisement. <laughs> I want to draw your attention first of all to the price points uh, that are reflected in the, uh, in the lower part of the advertisement vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the prices of uh, cruises today. Uh, but more importantly than that, um, I want to point to uh, the fact that one of our current Miami Business School students is actually featured in this advertisement. And I wonder if he's here this evening. Where? They, can you stand up for us, please, Jake? All right. Uh, st stay standing. We want to we, we, we do a side-by-side -side comparison here now. You are the little guy at the top of the ad, is that right? And when was this ad uh, done? Okay, how, and how did you happen to be uh, selected for the, uh, for the ad? Um, I just auditioned for it. All right. <laughs> I think you're auditioning again tonight. Uh, okay, so how about that? I mean, where else can you go other than Miami Business School where we're able to connect generations like this for a corporate supporter of ours? It's fantastic. Uh, I want to just remind everybody the amount of uh, connections between Carnival Corporation and Miami Business School is phenomenal. In many ways, every day, uh, Carnival executives are helping our students in terms of internships, capstone projects, hiring for permanent employment, coming here as speakers on our mentoring program. Uh, again and again, I run into faculty who are talking about how helpful uh, Carnival is and how important Carnival is to the success of our graduates. Uh, so I really want to thank Carnival Corporation. I know Arnold and his team have brought a couple of their talent uh, managers with them this evening who are going to be outside uh, at the end of the talk. So any students here who are interested, inspired by what you're going to hear uh, and want to connect with Carnival, you know, instead of forming a long line at the end of the hour uh, to, to see Arnold, uh, there are people outside who will be uh, delighted to take your names and uh, you'll connect with the right people and uh, uh, hopefully there'll be a future for you at Carnival. Uh, I want to thank uh, Arnold again for uh, coming this evening. I want to thank uh, our trustees and our Board of Overseers members uh, for being here, our other corporate supporters, also the Dean of our nursing school, Cindy Munro, uh, is here with us this evening. And uh, Arnold, uh, thank you so much for doing this for us. It's an honor to have you here. I think everybody knows uh, you've done this job for uh, six, seven years now. It's been a labor of love. Uh, you're a, such a fun guy and a great role model as a CEO for all of us, so thank you for being here. So other than the fact you got that handsome guy in that photo up there, the only other thing about it is the prices hadn't changed very much and since that's <laughs> so we got to work on that, right? All right, good. Um, so look, good evening everybody. I'm really happy to be here at the University of Miami and very honored to be part of the Distinguished Leader Series. I want to thank you, Dean Quelch, for inviting me and I want to acknowledge what you referenced, um, you know, the close connection uh, between Carnival and the University. And also want to acknowledge all the university 
trustees and faculty and students that are here tonight and alumni and special guests. So you know, the University of Miami alums are a very important part of the Carnival Corporation. We've hired more than 50 University of Miami graduates in the last 18 months alone. And I'm sure um, we're gonna be hiring a lot more and those of you um, who um, wanna explore some possibilities, as he mentioned, we have some talent acquisition people here and um, you might as well talk to somebody who actually does some work versus just talking to the overhead. So uh, go out there and check it out. So um, cruising is absolutely part of the landscape of South Florida. Um, you know, that drive along MacArthur Causeway, you see all the cruise ships lined up in a row and it's one of the most identifiable Miami images. You know, Miami is clearly the undisputed cruise capital of the world. Almost five and a half million people took a cruise out of Port of Miami in 2017. In fact, the global cruise industry is almost entirely run by companies that are based right here in Miami. The three largest, uh, representing nearly 80% of the entire cruise industry, Carnival Corporation, uh, Royal Caribbean, Norwegian, are all headquartered right here. Now at the same time, the cruise industry has a very positive impact on the Miami economy. Port Miami reports more than 21,800 direct jobs in Miami-Dade County and the surrounding areas and more than 320,000 related and indirect jobs. Direct wages from cargo and cruise activities total more than $893 million and more than $41 billion in economic activity through Miami-Dade County and the state of Florida. Now our namesake cruise line was born right here in Miami with just one ship, the Mardi Gras, back in 1972. And from that one ship, we've grown to be the largest leisure travel company in the world because Tad Arison, the founder of Carnival, had a different idea. He believed that cruising shouldn't just be a vacation for the wealthy. He started Carnival with the dream that it should be an affordable vacation for everyone and not just as a once in a lifetime experience, but something that you could look forward to and be able to afford to do every year or in some cases multiple times a year again and again and that it should be fun so from that one ship the Mardi Gras Carnival grew into a global cruise company with more than 120,000 passionate dedicated employees and more than 100 ships that sail nine different world leading cruise brands including Holland America Princess Cruises, Seaborn, Cunard, P&O UK, P&O Australia, our Italian brand Costa, our German brand Aida, and of course our namesake Carnival. And as we grew, the cruise industry as a whole grew. Our challenge today is to make sure that the guest gets on the right ship on the right brand. Each of our brands is unique and matching the guests with the brand that fits their specific vacation moment is what's critically essential. And it's not about demographics for us, it's all about what we call psychographics. So, are you looking for a super social experience for fun? Then Carnival is probably the right choice. Are you looking for romance with your partner or um, personal uh, self-reflection? Then you might want to try Princess. Do you want to be pampered like the rich and famous? That's our luxury brand, Seaborn. So I know the generally held belief is that the cruise lines are in competition with each other, but that's actually not the reality. We want everyone to do well and to succeed because if the other cruise lines aren't doing well, what will they do? All of you guys in marketing and in sales, they're gonna lower their prices and that's bad for business. So even more so, it is in our common interest to have high standards for safety in everything that happens on our ships, but also in the waters we sail. And we recognize that any issues or problems anywhere affect us all. And it's in all of our best interest to communicate, cooperate, and collaborate wherever possible. But since we are here in the business school tonight, I wanna take you behind the scenes in the cruise industry just a little bit. I wanna share with you some things you can't read about in your textbooks or Google on the internet 
uh, the unique challenges we face, how we recover from some difficult days, and the bright future we feel that lies ahead. And the first lesson is very, very obvious. Some people cruise to see far off places. Some people cruise for romance. Some people cruise to bring their family and friends together. But the fact is, unlike air travel or the hotel business, no one, no one has to take a cruise. It's totally voluntary. So let's take a look. time machines. Some take us back. They're called memories. Some take us forward. They're called dreams. they take us? What happens when we get there? Will we remain the same? Or will we never be the same again? Individually, we are a drop. Together, we are an ocean. So one of our big challenges, uh, for how many of you have cruised? How many have cruised? Oh, we are in the right spot here. So <laughs> those few of you who haven't, just talk to the people next to you, okay? But, but one of the magical things um, about cruise that that's trying to emote is um, you know, just the, the feeling that, that you get, the human spirit feeling. And so um, we're constantly looking for ways to try to emote that for people who haven't cruised so they can realize what, what they're missing out on. So look, it's a complex business. We build cities and then we sail them around the world. Um, we are in the hotel business and we buy mattresses and uniforms and cleaning supplies. Uh, we're definitely obviously a transportation business. We employ a maritime crew of almost 5,000 officers. We have a state-of-the-art uh, facility to train those officers and our mayor um, outside of Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Um, with you know, leading edge technology on simulation, et cetera. We're in the restaurant business. Our chefs, who are amongst the top chefs in the world, um, Thomas Keller, Per Se French Laundry is our chef for Seaborn. Um, you know, we have uh, just every line has you know, well-renowned chefs. They create 
delicious meals on our ships <clears throat> all over the world every day. Uh, we are one of the largest gaming companies with over 100 casinos that can run 24 hours a day on board the ships. And we are one of the biggest entertainment companies. We provide world-class entertainment on ships every night all over the world. You know, a few years ago, I don't know if the statistic holds true today, we're also, um, because we do so much retail on board, at one point we are the world's biggest art dealer. So something you would never think about, but um, people are on vacation, they have time, and we don't try to sell anything. If you just make available to you what you want, you're on vacation, you, you'll buy it. So we just need to understand what people want and make it available. Uh, we help design and build the most modern, safe, and environmentally sustainable cruise ships. Plus, we have an onshore team of people that not only help those ships run, but also make certain that uh, 250,000 guests every day want to cruise with us. And we are, in fact, living in a golden age of cruising. Our ships are based all over the world, and our guests come from almost every country. We cruise to all seven continents and more than 700 ports around the globe. Today, there are almost 500 cruise ships on the ocean, with new ships coming online as fast as the shipyards can build them. More than 27 million people are expected to take a cruise this year somewhere in the world. And while these are, in fact, some of the greatest days the cruise industry has ever seen, it hasn't always been that way. Uh, some of you might recall just a few years ago, the cruise industry hit some rough seas and operating what we would call a perfect storm. Since the early 1970s, the cruise industry had experienced steady growth and expansion around the world. But starting in 2008 through 2013, a series of world-shaking events took place. The global financial crisis, the Arab Spring, the BP oil spill, and unfortunately, a number of highly publicized ship itinerary disruptions. So the new instant communications through smartphones and social media meant photos and videos were quickly shared around the world without context and without facts. And during that same period, industry capacity expanded dramatically and fuel costs doubled. Consequently, operating performance suffered, leading to falling income, below market shareholder returns, and declining return on invested capital. The industry was no longer the darling it was during the time of the TV show, The Love Boat, and we became a frequent target of the media. Uh, in 2013, I had been on the Carnival Board for 12 years, and not once had I even thought about running a company. In fact, when the lead director called to tell me uh, they were gonna split the roles of chairman and CEO, yeah, I thought he was gonna ask me to be on the search committee or something. Instead, he said, we'd like you to do it. And um, in addition to being totally shocked because I'm on the board, when were they having these meetings, okay? I mean, I, I, I'm supposed to know what's going on. Um, <laughs> I, I, I almost told him no on the spot. And, and, and I'm really glad I didn't. And then only was because I was cruising through life. I had retired early and I was having a lot of fun on some minor league basketball teams. I was just goofing off, having a good time. <clears throat> but I'm really glad I didn't say no. Uh, this is the best job in the world. Um, it really is. I, I started in July 2013, just over five years ago, not six or seven, but I, pre I know it looks like I've been there longer, you know, but only five. And immediately set forth on a path to um, build on the great legacy that was there. People said it would take at least a decade for cruising to fully recover its reputation and previous popularity. So the first thing I did was listen. I listened to our leadership, our brand presidents, to our managers, to our people at all levels in the company, all levels, administrative assistants, cabin stewards, everybody, to our guests, to people who had never cruised, um, to community leaders in the places we sailed, and to the locals on the streets, to the media, to investors, and to those who wouldn't invest. I listened, and I listened, and I listened. And some of the things that needed to be addressed were obvious. Uh, Carnival Corporation had gone through acquisition from Carnival Cruise Lines, I mentioned back in 72, to a group of 10, at that time, different world-leading cruise lines that were all run independently. In fact, they barely knew each other, 
and even in their minds competed against each other by you know, holding data from each other like itinerary planning and purchasing and so on. So the first thing I did was I brought everybody together. You know, we had team building exercises, we worked to understand the character of each brand, and most importantly, we committed to working together in the future. And then we laid a foundation of communication, coordination, and collaboration. It was a huge cultural shift, but it's not centralization. If you look at industries over time, and especially in capitalist societies, you know, if you want to innovate, you decentralize. You want to control costs, you centralize. And corporations that have the privilege of being around for a while, they look like accordions. You know, they centralize, decentralize. In our case, I didn't want to centralize and I didn't want to decentralize. The reality is people sell on brands, they don't sell on the corporation, so the power has to be in the brands. And I asked these three fundamental questions. What does success look like for you and your family five years from now? What does success look like for your brand or department five years from now? And what does success look like for this corporation five years from now? I paired the leaders up, I had them report out to the larger group, their paired partners response to these questions to practice their own listening skills. Together, we came up with a group vision for our company and basically it says we deliver unmasked joyful vacation experiences and breakthrough shareholder returns by exceeding guest expectations and leveraging our scale. Job one, job one is to exceed our guest expectations. We need to do that every day, all the time. If we do that, all things are possible. If we don't do it, nothing else matters. That simple sentence summed up everything we do. For our customer, we're producing a product and experience that helps them be happy and joyful. Sustained breakthrough shareholder returns mean we're delivering for our stakeholders, but not just the shareholders. It's all the freedom to operate. So it's the local communities we touch, it's all of our partners uh, that work with us, our travel professional partners, our partners um, that we you know, buy goods and services from, the governments we interact with, is, is that we're delivering for those stakeholders. And we're leveraging our scale, and that means we're working together as a global company of the world's leading cruise lines. Now we started by leveraging our scale in revenue management, itinerary planning, shipbuilding, media, and purchasing. Just on the purchasing portion, we purchased over $9 billion a year in goods and services, and it was almost entirely uncoordinated. One of my favorite stories is arugula. So we buy arugula, and there were um, seven different brands had contracts from arugula, all from the same arugula distributor, all at different prices. So that didn't last long. So for example, <laughs> We are the fifth largest purchaser of airline travel in the world, and yet never once had approached an airline for a global discount to leverage that scale. So getting separate purchasing departments to work together in different countries and cultures um, was a challenge, uh, but the results are very, very strong. By the end of this year, we expect to realize savings that will be nearly $360 million just by working together. Um, by leveraging our scale, um, not only for cost containment, but as I mentioned, for revenue generation as well. So marketing and communicating our story obviously is a priority. From my first day on the job, I started talking to the media about our business, our ships, about cruising in general, to help rebuild our image and our reputation in the eyes of the media and the perception of the public, but also the perception of our guests and our potential guests. Now our strategy was to get crews out there in unexpected ways and to subtly insert crews into the conversation. So our goal is every day you get hit multiple times with some positive image about Cruise. So we started with our first ever Super Bowl ad. Now I told our marketing team to win the share of voice before the ad ever ran. So we filmed four different ads. One funny, one touching, one slightly risque, and we asked people to go online and vote for their favorite. And then there was the mystery ad that they couldn't see, and which of course is the one we ran. So <laughs> instead of just a one minute ad during the game, our campaign took advantage of all the media attention that came beforehand. All the anticipation around what ads would be shown on Super Bowl Sunday. In fact, we were featured in several of those shows that they talk about, here's the ads that's likely to win. And um, two of our ads were winning in those shows, we didn't even run those ads. And we got people to watch all four of our ads instead of just seeing one. 
Now, while the media numbers for the ads on Super Bowl Sunday were great, we generated over 10 billion media impressions with the overall effort. Now, I know the CEO of Kellogg um, showed that their Super Bowl TV ad last week, and it was funny whenever he was here, and it was funny, and it was loud like most Super Bowl ads are. Uh, we decided to take a slightly different approach, one that might not be expected from a cruise company that's all about fun. So we wanted to evoke the magic of a cruise, that feeling that you kind of saw maybe in that first piece, um, but that feeling you get on board and once you've cruised that you really understand. So let's take a quick look at the Super Bowl ad. I uh, really uh, don't know why it is that uh, all of us are so committed to the sea, except I am, uh, I think it's because, in addition to the fact that the sea uh, changes, and the light changes and uh, ships change, it's because uh, we all came from the sea. And it is an interesting uh, biological fact that all of us have in our veins the exact same percentage of salt in our blood that exists in the ocean. And therefore, uh, we have salt in our blood, in our sweat, in our tears. We are tied to the ocean. And when we go back to the sea, whether it is to sail or to watch it, we are going back from whence we came. Yeah, has that voice? Yeah, for all you young people out there who might not, that's on John F. Kennedy. And so um, serendipity is the mother of success. So we. Um, he just happened to give a speech back in the 60s at a yacht club that was about 58 seconds long. <laughs> and so, um, so it perfectly fit, and we got permission from the family, and so we, we used, the, used his voice. Uh, but obviously, we need to do a lot more. Uh, we need to do a lot of thinking and a lot of innovation. And for us, innovation is all about the human spirit. You know, it's about people. It's not about technology. Um, at Carnival, we want to create human connections in unique ways, maybe even unexpected ways, that will enhance the guest experience. The human interaction of travel um, is, is really what it's all about. Now, when I get letters from happy guests, it's almost always about the human connections that they made on their cruise, and that's what made it special. So the innovation is when, without them even realizing it, our guests become part of the community, feeling connected in ways that makes them not want to leave, and when they're gone, they can't wait to come back. And for those of you who've never cruised before, only a few of you, we call you the new to cruise segment, and we want to get you to think about taking a cruise, making you comfortable, knowing what to expect, showing you how much fun it can be, all the great experiences you can have, and how much you're missing if you're not cruising. Now, we've created a series of television programs and we have five, two on ABC, one on NBC, one on Telemundo, one on Univision. Here in the U.S. alone, we've got two shows in the U.K. We've got movies, some other things in Italy. Uh, we have our own digital network, Ocean View. You can download it on, um, uh, which one? Uh, Roku, Apple TV, yep. So our own digital network. Uh, and then, of course, we have commercials. And the commercials show our guests interacting on ships and in fabulous destinations all over the world. And then last January at the Kasumi Electronics Show in Vegas, we announced our Ocean Platform featuring the Ocean Medallion. That was the first time a travel company had been invited to give the keynote, and it exposed us to an enormous new audience in the tech industry. It generated almost 20 billion media impressions on sites that would never have otherwise covered a cruise company. And at the same time, we disrupted our current thinking. In our world, for communities to thrive, the businesses in that community must thrive in a capitalist society like ours. In order for businesses to thrive over time, they need to innovate. And at its core, innovation is thinking outside the box, it's diversity of thinking. A diverse group aligned on a common goal with a work process that fosters true inclusion equal respect, equal voice, equal opportunity for each team member, will outperform a homogeneous group every time. 
and I've been a key part of transforming three industries during my career. All three by purposefully ensuring we had diverse teams that operated against the common goal with inclusion. Engineering diverse teams that work well together is a business imperative for sustained business success and ultimately for societal prosperity. Which is why at Carnival Corporation, about 10 cruise brands, we now have four um, women presidents, one LG uh, B, uh, BT uh, president, a female group CEO, and the first black president of a cruise line. And then there's me. And I've spent my life trying to be a loud voice for diversity, but diversity only works when all vo voices are heard equally. Now I know what it's like um, kind of to be the only one at the table, to have others assume you don't belong, to assume you're not competent for the task, to talk over you or simply ignore you completely, to not be included or to be purposefully, conscientiously uninvited. And I believe we need to own a broader definition of diversity that includes but goes well beyond the color of one's skin or sexual identity or orientation include diversity of ideas, of styles of behavior, of knowledge, of age, and of experience. Inclusion means welcoming people who may not think like us or act like us. And it may be difficult or argumentative at times, who may challenge our patience, but they also challenge our status quo. So remember, I said that people back in 2013 were saying it would take at least a decade for cruising to recover its reputation and popularity. It took about 18 months. And in part, that's because the people who loved us, our guests, never really left. They knew what cruising was really like. Now, our ships continue to sail full, but the combination of increasing demand, onboard revenue growth, and cost containment meant that by the end of 2014, things were already turning around, and by 2017, our earnings were up by 155% in five years. And in the last five years, our share price has increased from $34.29 on June 28, 2013, to last week's high of $62.06, .06, with a 52-week high of almost 73 bucks. And we've outpaced the S&P 500, and, well, 500 and we're well on the path to double-digit return on invested capital. And our revenue has grown from $15.5 billion in 2013 to $17.5 billion last year. Our challenge became, and it remains today, to increase demand, which will in turn, you know, obviously uh, drive yield. Our competition today is actually land-based vacations, not the other cruise lines. 27 million people, as I said, take a cruise this year, will take a cruise this year somewhere in the world. Now, that's a lot, but consider this. About 42 million people visit Las Vegas every year. And in 2017, more than 72 million people visited Orlando, okay? So all the cruise ship cabins on all the ships represent only 2% of the world's hotel rooms. We are a tiny player in the tourism sector. In fact, I mentioned 500 cruise ships. There are statistics that suggest if the cruise industry did not exist, you wouldn't be able to measure the difference in emissions in the atmosphere. That's how small we are. So the average cost of a land-based vacation, when you add up the airfare, the hotel room, food, entertainment, car rentals, et cetera, is much more expensive than a cruise. Cruising is not only the best vacation value there is, it's absolutely the best vacation period, and you guys know because most of you raise your hands. So we are aggressively renewing our fleet. Um, we're aggressively enhancing our fleet by building new ships, uh, rejuvenating old ones, and retiring or selling others that you know, just aren't as efficient as the new ones are. And we have 22 new ships scheduled for delivery, 22, between 2018 and 2025. And that includes four new ships this year alone. But the entire industry is constrained by the limited capacity of shipyards that can build cruise ships. That's a good thing for us, in a way, because it constrains the capacity that the most industry can grow in a year is 7%. I know a lot of industries would love to have that constraint. So the cruise industry is a very small part also of the entire maritime industry compared to cargo ships or tankers. But we are the most visible and we're the most identifiable and we take sustainability very seriously. You know, our ships are marvels of recycling and reuse. Our new ships are even more efficient 
using less fuel and trying new fuels like liquefied natural gas. In fact, we're partnering with Shell to build a global network of LNG capability that will supply not just our new LNG-enabled ships, but also make it possible for others to build LNG-enabled cargo and container ships, lessening the impact of shipping everywhere around the globe. And while we are held to a high standard by the public, we hold ourselves to an even higher standard. You know, we work our supply chain partners to source responsibly and have created our business partner code of conduct and ethics, which covers human rights, anti-corruption, safe working conditions, and environmental protection. And we partner with organizations that are doing a phenomenal job in conserving the maritime environment, like the Nature Conservancy. At Carnival, we believe that sustainability is not just linked to the natural environment, it also includes labor practices, social issues, and economics, ensuring that the communities we visit benefit in a positive way. And as I mentioned earlier, there's the global impact of the entire cruise industry at a time when countries, once again, seem to be moving apart more than working together, restricting borders, exiting trade agreements. The cruise industry is an example of global cooperation. We operate in more than 140 countries, and we sell guests to every continent around the world. And one of the most popular cruises we offer are world cruises, which often sell out more than a year in advance. Not only do people want to cruise, countries want cruise ships to visit. 2016 cruise industry expenditures generate over $126 billion in total output worldwide, employing more than one million people in some aspect of the global cruise industry, either with a cruise line as a travel professional agent or in the industries directly affiliated, like shipbuilding, are as suppliers and generating, as I mentioned, 41 billion in wages. Now, what these numbers don't reflect, however, is the economic multiplier effect, as the dollars spent by us and our guests trickle down through the places we visit. Cruising helps create small and large businesses around the world, bringing jobs and hope in many isolated places where opportunities are scarce, from the construction work of building new roads to the port worker to the chef their own small restaurant, to uh, the Cuban cab driver touring a couple in his classic car, to the artist in a local craft market selling her work. Cruise tourism contributes to the sustainable development of ports, neighboring communities, and their people. And we also provide direct employment on board our ships to the many crew members that may have limited opportunities due to social, political situations in their home countries. Providing safe, and stable employment on board our ships enables them to support themselves as well as their families back home. and provides experience and skills and a grounding in best management practice that are an essential part of our company that they can also take back home. But then there's the other less recognized impact of the cruise industry, which may actually be the most important. In these days of political uncertainty, it's the simple traveler who becomes the ambassador. We're taking millions of these ambassadors every year to Mexico, to Russia, to China, to the Middle East, to Cuba, and here to the United States. We become living and breathing human beings, not flat images on the nightly news or disconnected words on social media. Travel is the antidote to ignorance. And the more people cruise and see the world firsthand, the more they discover what they share in common, and they learn to appreciate, respect, and even celebrate their differences rather than the fear. We want our ships to be good corporate citizens and our guests and crew to always be welcomed in the more than 700 ports we visit, bringing hope, prosperity, and goodwill wherever we sail. I'm very proud of the positive influence the cruise industry can have in the world and for the role we at Carnival are playing in bringing that world closer together today and in the future. So I feel very lucky to be living in this golden age. Uh, there's never been a better time to cruise. I want to thank you for listening. I look forward to taking your questions. Okay? Thank you. Just uh, introduce the Q&A on okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Arnold, th th thanks very much for the uh, inspiring comments. Um, I think uh, it really expanded our vision of what uh, a cruise uh, company is all about. 
Um, we're going to take some questions. Remember, that is a single sentence that ends with a question mark. Um, <laughs> so let me, let me show you how it's done. What do you do to ensure you exceed guest expectations every day? First, what, the what are the three most important? First things? thing we do is listen to the guests. So if you ask the guests, they'll tell you what you need to do to exceed their expectations. So it's very common sense stuff. Now, there's an art in market research, there's an art in getting feedback, and there's an art in, in learning how to listen to the guests. But, but that's what we do, we, we listen to the guests. And each brand is oriented around, I guess, all of you at different times want different things. Sometimes you want to um, be with your spouse. Sometimes you're going to go with your college buddies. Those are two different experiences. You're going to take your kids. You're going to travel with your grandparents. Two different experiences. And so we don't try to, our brands are focused on a particular community and an experience. And the brands understand that. And then they, they listen to the guests who are looking for that experience to make sure that we're delivering the things that would exceed their expectations. But, but that's the essence of it. So we do it lots of different ways, but it's listening to the guests. Quick follow-up, uh, Asia and China. Yeah. Guests from that region who are new to cruising, any differences in the way you have to approach them? Sure. So there's differences with Australians versus Americans or Midwest Americans versus Americans on the West Coast. Everybody's different. Um, but the reality is uh, China is probably going to be the largest cruise market in the world. It'll probably be as big as the entire cruise industry is today. Um, but it's not going to happen with just the cruise company building ships for China. Because every market in the world is large and every market is underpenetrated. So we don't really have enough ships. We can only build so many ships. You're going to have enough ships to send to China to build that market. Um, so what we've done is we partnered, and what's going to make it happen is it's a centrally planned economy. Uh, what's going to make it happen is if the government you know, decides they're going to build a cruise industry, which they have. So in their five-year plan, China has highlighted cruise as a major economic driver. So that says the government is committed to cruise. So we partnered with CSSC, the, a state-owned enterprise that's one of the largest shipbuilders in, in China. And um, we partnered with them and with CIC, the Sovereign Fund, uh, to help China build a cruise industry. So for domestic cruising, which would be where most of the people would initially go, um, we see that as the way forward. Meanwhile, you know, there are a whole, you know, China is huge, 135 million outbound tourists a year. Even if you're double counting, that's still 60 something million. Uh, it's the largest outbound tourist nation in the world. So you go anywhere in the world and you see lots of Chinese as tourists. So for us, it's important to have those people connect with the concept of fly crews and to get them to the experience the world, uh, not only through staycations, but, but through cruising. Thank you. Cool. Questions? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Let's, let's take the one in the middle. Wait for the microphone, if you wouldn't mind, please. We can get a microphone quickly to the middle. Can you just Pass it down, please. Thank you. Hello. Um, What's the transition been like from first joining Carnival to now being its CEO? What's the transition been like? You know, for me, I cheated, right? Because I was on the board for 12 years. So I knew a lot of leadership. Um, to say I, I knew the business, I knew it at the board level, which is governance and oversight and that sort of thing. But I didn't really know, you know, the, the working details of the business. And some of my people would say, you still don't, Arnold, you know? So, <laughs> but, um, but the reality is um, the transition for me was smooth and fun. It really was. Um, you know, I, I had a lot of relatedness. I knew the board. In fact, the first thing I did when they asked me, I said, well, I got to meet with each board member individually because, you know, uh, Mitch Medica's here. He was on the board at once. I think they may have liked me as a, as a board member, but that doesn't mean they think I can run the company. So I wanted to hear each board member tell me, no, we want you to do it. And so I met with them individually to make sure, because at that stage of life for me, I wasn't looking for a lot of hassle. So, so bottom line is it, the transition was, was really smooth. The, um, the people are so passionate and committed. They, they just want to exceed guest expectations and do a great job. That's really what they want to do. Thanks. Uh, Adam Carlin, uh, second row. We'll wait for the mic, Adam, if you could. Thank you, Arnold, for yeah. this has been great. So I read somewhere it was like 12 million passengers a year, so that's something like 250,000 passengers a, a week. Day. 
What keeps you up at night? Of all the things that are on your mind, what, if anything, come, keeps you up at night? If you always ask me that question. So the truth is, most recently, it was the second season of Ozark on Netflix, OK? Because <laughs> the only time I can watch is like really late at night, right? So I got through it all, too. I binged that. It was good. It was really good. So, um, so that's usually what keeps me up, is binge watching stuff. But um, seriously, this is our business every year. Every year, there's typhoons, cyclones, and hurricanes somewhere in the world. Every year. So while there was a lot of noise here in Florida last year because of the hurricanes, year before we had stuff in Asia, you know, we, every year we have typhoons, cyclones, and hurricanes. Every year. Every year we have geopolitical tension. Every year there's some place you used to be able to go, you can't go. You used to be able to go to the Black Sea, can't go there now. You know, you used to be able to go to um, Turkey, can't go there now, right. Uh, so every year that happens. Every year, there's economic malaise somewhere in the world. Every year, there's a disease scare, Ebola, Zika, MERS, every year. Now, so far this year, knock on wood, there hasn't been one, so, you know. But almost every year, it happens. So that's the normal. It's normal. And so we have to be able to manage all that within our business. And what we told the street and told the investors is that, look, when I took over, we were at 4.5% return on investor capital. And I said, within five years, we're going to be at double-digit return on invested capitals because every year, currencies go the wrong way, fuel spikes, you know, or both, you know, which is horrible when that happens in our business. Um, but we said in all those environments, because of the fundamentals of this business and this industry, we can still deliver double-digit return on invested capital. And uh, we just have to manage to that. And every year, we manage expecting a lot of things to go wrong. So if you don't expect that, you're going to be revising in the street every quarter. If you expect it, the revisions go the other way. So, How is Caribbean recovery and what have you contributed? Yeah, um, well, first of all, in terms of um, just the people recovery, you know, the cruise industry, as did a lot of other people, stepped up right away. And, and for us, you know, it's not just like we're going to go help the Caribbean. Our employees live in the Caribbean. I mean, it's our people. So, you know, is, you're going to help. It's just second nature. It's not even a thought. So, you know, we obviously were there right away. Um, the biggest thing with that is, oh, you guys, as you get to manage things, just, you got to watch it because, you know, people are so anxious to help. So I'll tell you a quick story. On one of our employees, we were going to fly down, and he was like, oh, I'm going to bring some stuff on the plane so because I know they need stuff. I said, okay, well, make sure you understand what they need. So he, got it, he had all this water, okay? And he had gone to the, um, uh, Sam's or somewhere, he got all this stuff, and loaded down the plane, the company plane. And I was like, man, I was going to visit a bunch of places. We're going to burn up enough fuel. I'm not going to get to go to one place now. And I said, they, they don't need water, man. And, you know, that's already happened. And so, so we get there. I said, I'll tell you what, when we land, I bet you the first thing you do is offer us water, okay? When we landed, the first thing you did was offer us water. So, so the point being, you can't just rush out willy-nilly. You've got to really understand the people and what the needs are and stuff. And, um, and so, you know, that's what we do. So the recovery is fantastic. First of all, people get confused on the Caribbean. You guys probably don't because you're close enough. But, you know, there's 80-something ports in the Caribbean. So five of them that frequently got severely affected. Those five are all back up and running, and most of them were back up and running in a relatively short period of time. The other 75 were untouched. So our ship sailed full the whole time to the Caribbean you know, after. And importantly, it's important for those other places because, you know, it's a big part of their economy. So they need people to come back soon. So, you know, we, we work to help them do that, and, and it's going great. It's going yeah. great. Great. Uh, yeah. Gentleman in the uh, uh, jacket there with the blue shirt, thank you. This has been very interesting. Uh, could you give us three things that you are that you took away from your years at Monsanto that you have employed here? Yeah, thank you. So three things, I used to be at Monsanto company, I ran the agricultural business. I'm the bad guy, I'm the guy that commercialized the products improved through the use of modern biotechnology. So that was me. I was present at the time when that happened. Um, you know, um, which by the way, is saving the planet, I'm just saying, but that's okay. <laughs> so, um, but, but the reality is, um, the number one thing I learned was you have to take people with you, okay? But at the same time, you know, you have to at least put out 
the facts, okay? So for example, right now, um, we get a lot of questions about emissions and ports. So it's very important for us, I feel, to put the facts out. That doesn't mean the facts will carry the day. It doesn't, okay? But you have to at least know what facts you're standing on, and then you have to try to propose what's truly a net benefit for society versus what's popular in the media or the press or public opinion. You at least have to try. In the end, you know, we have to comply with all laws and regulations. We absolutely will. And, you know, we have to listen to locals and give in to what they want because, you know, if locals aren't happy, our guests aren't going to be happy because who wants to go someplace where people don't want them? And so, but we got to at least try. And so that was a, a huge lesson. Uh, that one. And then the second one is just the employee stuff, is that it's all the diversity stuff. I, I transformed two industries when I was at Monsanto, for that, before lawn and garden industry and then, law, and then agriculture industry. That was a big part of transforming both those industries, not just what Monsanto did in it. And, um, and the reality is, you know, if you listen to your customer, in our case, our guest, they will tell you what you need to do. And if you listen to your employees that do the work every day, they will tell you how to deliver that to the guests in a way that's sustainable for the company. And you just have to learn to listen and, and not sit somewhere off dreaming of stuff on your own. So thank you for your speech. Um, I'd like to know, after a tragedy such as what happened to the Costa ship in 2013, how do you manage to uh, get your customers to, uh, to trust your company again? Yeah. Great question. So here's the, the interesting part. So I, I can give you the facts. And we're having this so we can talk about the facts. So terrible tragedy. People died. So automatically, that's, a no, that's horrible, period, OK? Um, fact is 4,000 people on the ship, you know, all but 38 were fine. That's an interesting fact, but irrelevant because 30-something people died, okay? And that's, you can't have that, all right? Um, but because of that, because of where it was, because of the, we didn't have a problem with our guests, with our customers. You know, people did not stop cruising. People were not like, oh, I used to cruise, but I'm not going to cruise now. That did not happen. What did happen was people who hadn't cruised, they already had reasons why they weren't cruising, and that certainly didn't encourage them to cruise. So that's what really happened, and that was the thing we really had to deal with. It wasn't so much your guest base, but it's that future you know, base that you need. And, and that's, that's where you know, it was. And then you just have to do the right things. You've got you know, you got, you got to act right and behave right. You try to give the facts, you know, and, and in this case, you know, that one, you know, we spend billions of dollars. You know, there's a strong argument that the best thing to do with that ship would have been to have sunk it where it was because they got all the fuel off and all that right away. To sunk it where it was and it have been a great, you know, reef eventually, um, as opposed to trying to float it and ship it across and dismantle it. So billions and billions of dollars have got spent doing that. And you can make an argument there was a better way to spend that money for society than that. But in the end, that's what the Italian government wanted to do, and so that's what we did, right? Um, and so I, I think in terms of restoring the confidence, the reality is it's an incident like an airplane crashes. Well, people don't stop flying. And eventually, you know, and so we, we just had to restore confidence that it is safe, okay? that we do do all the, all the proper things. So we took people to our mayor, to our training center, so they could see all of that. We took people on the ships so they could see all that. And then we reported statistics for the industry, which is much, much better than you know, driving or airline or anything. I mean, you, you don't have a lot of ships going down losing people. So, yeah. um, well, gentleman in the dark jacket right at the back, second row in. All right, thank you. Um, I, I should have two questions, but um, okay. So the first one is, what's the forecast of Carnival Cruise arrivals to destinations like Mexico, where the Department of State constantly warns its citizens to be cautious or avoid travel due to crime or any other safety issues? So that's my first one. Okay. And my next one is kind of like to go on the positive note. 
Um, what, are plan what are your plans as it relates to expansion to destinations in the Americas? Okay, cool. Uh, so on the first one, you know, we get those, so we're tied to every intelligence community in the world and we're tied to every law enforcement agency in the world and we get reports constantly all day long and, and what have you. Um, when a, a government chooses to issue a, a warning statement to travelers, um, you know, that obviously can impact the demand to go there. And, and in the end, we take people where they want to go. I mean, because then again, we're about exceeding our guests' expectations. If they don't want to go somewhere, we're just, we're not going to make them go there. You know, we're not going to do that. Um, but what we do try to do is not overreact the other way and say, because there's a warning, we're not going. You know, if there's a real threat, we're not going. But sometimes there are warnings or cautionary things, and sometimes, I'm not saying the case in Mexico, I don't know the specific one you're referring to, but sometimes places get treated differently, okay? And so, you know, we make certain we're not taking anybody in the harm's way. Okay, but I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana originally. And you guys live in Miami, okay? So if somebody said, don't go to Miami because there was a shooting, that sounds ridiculous, right? The same thing for me from New Orleans, like don't go to New Orleans because there was a shooting. So it depends what's really going on and the extent of it. Um, so we try not to overreact. And again, we're connected to every law enforcement agency and every intelligence community in the world. So you know, we, we can get the facts and then we, we act out of that. Okay, let's see if we, uh, are there any ladies who would like to ask a question here? Uh, yes, please, ma'am, in the uh, third row. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for this excellent presentation. Yeah, you. Uh, you mentioned demographic versus psychographic, yeah, and yeah. I'd like to hear more about that, especially as it relates to the millennials. <laughs> So I'll answer the millennials, but here's the simplest way to talk about it. We have two brands, Princess and Holland America, Princess Cruise and Holland America. And for a long time, it may be a little different now, but for, uh, when I first came in for sure, five years ago, if, if you map income and age for those two brands, the distribution curves were identical. You could superimpose them on each other. And so those brands thought they were competing with each other. But if you stood in Ketchikan in Alaska and watched people getting off the ship, you could go Princess Holland America, Princess Holland America, because the psychographic is different. So I promised Holland America I wouldn't do, but in this group I'll do it one more time, because they, they think people misinterpret it. So Holland America is Warren Buffett Platt, okay? So what does that mean? It doesn't mean it's old people or anything. What it means is Warren Buffett is super successful, but very understated, okay? Super successful person, plenty of money, very understated guy, not flashy, okay? And so that's how in America, they've got, it's, it's not that people are from a geography or a place, but the mindset is they'll over-index on religion. That's a little demographic, okay, versus some other brands. But, it, but it's people that have a, a certain value system in life, okay? That's slightly different, not dramatically different, slightly different. But it's noticeable, it's how they dress. They like getting on an air-conditioned bus to go to the museum. Princess is Southern California chic, luxury Hong Kong hotel, polo shirts. They want to see kayak to the museum themselves. Same age, same everything. But you see them, they look different. You know, they just look different. And so it's not universal, but it's dramatic. And so that's what psychographic is. It's, it's how in a moment, what experience you're looking for. So that takes me to your millennial question. Millennials, everybody says, over index on experiences, which is true. That's a true statement. And people say, well, how are you gonna market the millennials? We already do. First of all, a lot of millennials go with their families on, on cruises. We do a lot of weddings. That's a lot of millennials. And, and why? Because cruise is an experience and it's accessible. You know, cruise is, from a value standpoint, is a far better value than the equivalent land-based vacation. So millennials tend to be younger. Some of them are super wealthy, but some of them are not. And so they have access, but also they're into experiences. And so they over-index on crews already. And um, so that's, that's it in a nutshell. Cool. I don't know if it helps, but the uh, last cruise I took was on Holland America. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <which> <laughs> 
I don't know if that says more about me or Holland America, but there we are. Gentlemen over here. I'd like to give you a compliment for your Southern Caribbean cruise. Ah, you earned an A plus. Ah, thank you. I was you. there last month. But thank my you. question is, I'm retired. Uh -huh. What are you going to do for the retirees in the future? So what are we going to do for retirees? We're going to keep giving you great experiences and keep, <laughs> and, keep it, and keep it affordable, man. So, you know, the reality is when you ask about millennials, but in a number of countries in the world, the number of retirees is increasing dramatically. That is great for our business. Because one thing about a cruise is you have to have time. And so as long as we keep it affordable, and by the way, it's way more cost effective, as I mentioned, than equivalent land-based vacation. So for somebody on more fixed income, it's actually a better deal than trying to you know, travel another way. It's simpler, it's easier. For older people who are worried about it, the doctor's right there. You don't have to go, the doctor's right there with you. Okay, so, but it's true, you know, I mean, it's all true. So for us, you know, that whole demographic shift, even though we're into psychographics, that whole demographic shift is, is good for our business in the long run. Maybe in blue. Yeah. Uh, you spoke of, great talk, uh, you spoke of China as a market, you didn't speak of the other big market. Is India opening up for cruises and is that the untapped new place to be going to? One of the challenges in China is exacerbated further in India. One of the challenges in China is you got to sail somewhere, okay? And um, in China, there's actually places to sail, but they don't have a whole lot of vacation days for the mass of the population. There's still plenty of people in China who can take 10, 14 days, 21 days, but, you know, because the country's just so big, like India is. But India, for domestic sailing, you know, where you're going to go and how much time you have and so on and so forth. So, um, so, so that's part of the issue. Um, cruising is popular amongst East Indians, but not to the extent that we've been able to determine so far where you could fill a ship every week, you know, many ships every week, you know, out of a single port in India. But to fly cruise, you know, for sure. Um, but the, most of the Indian population, you know, a cruise is still kind of inaccessible, as you know, so, yeah. Uh, the gentleman with the. Uh, Should we take two more? Yeah, let's take two. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir, you, you, you with your hand still up, if we could get the microphone to you. And then we'll take the, uh, the lady in blue straight ahead of me. Chief. Uh, you've mentioned that though 27 million people are planning to take a cruise, but that only contributes to 2% of the world's like, um, vacation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, where do you see the potential, or how can this percentage be increased and going forward? and? Here's, a, here's a, one of the great things for our industry. You know, the, the analysts right now are all worried about capacity because they think the industry is cyclical. So we'll see who's right. You know, we're not worried about it, but they are. So um, the reality is it's not going to change for a long time because there are more people traveling each year. There, the, the population of people traveling is growing faster than there is capacity to build ships. The most our industry can grow in a given year is 7%. That's the max, okay? And, um, and we don't grow that fast because we, you know, we have, the industry's getting older now. We have 50-year-plus industry, so we have ships we have to retire just because, you know, they've gotten past useful life. And so, you know, we can't grow even at 7% in a year as an industry. Um, and so we're always going to be in a very low percentage, and then if you get places like China and India coming in, not even in the calculation. If you throw them in, that number drops like a brick, right? And so it's going to be that way for a while, which is great for our industry. It gives us a chance to you know, sustain pricing, create demand and excess of supply, and so on and so forth. And there's such a big gap between our price and equivalent land-based vacation, we can raise our prices substantially and still be a better value versus the real competition, which is beaches and other land-based vacations. So it's, gonna, it's an artifact of the construct. I mean, we're going to be stuck there for a while. Now, having said that, that number of 27 million is probably going to go with the growth that's planned you know, to a number that's more like 40 million or something. But it's still going to be percentage-wise small. Yeah. And as I said, Orlando, 70 million tourists. Ve Vegas, 42. Eventually, we'll get as many people as Vegas. You know, Time. Like, yeah. Yes.
How does Carnival differ itself from competitors rather than by sheer size? For example, Virgin Cruise is starting operations in Miami in 2020-2021 with clientele 18 years or older. Does Carnival see a threat to competitors positioning themselves in this way? Okay, so first of all, we love Virgin. You know why? They announced in 2015 and they got a whole lot of publicity. And what do we want? Because for us, one of every two people who cruise in the world cruise with us. We have almost 50% share globally. So if, if somebody's thinking about a cruise, we got a pretty good chance of getting them. So, so they're out there in 2015 promoting cruise. Their first shift's not coming until 2020. So, <laughs> so, so for me, I'm like, you know, that's great. Richard Branson flying here some more and get some more media out there about cruise. So that's all positive. So the second thing is when they come, they're going to have a ship. Maybe two, eventually three, you know. We got 106 ships. We're building four ships a year. So it's all good. It's just positive. Um, we already sell real happy 18 years old and above and so on. They're going to introduce some cool new stuff, I'm hoping, okay. If it's cool enough and, and it resonates with our guests, we'll copy it. That's cool, you know. Um, it, it, we're not competing with them, you know. It's, it's just irrelevant. It's not irre it's relevant, but we're not competing with them. So, so uh, Richard Fain is very keen on his rock climbing wall. Yeah. What's new at uh, Carnival this year? So for us, um, the newest thing is the LNG. So we just um, you guys heard of David Guetta, the DJ. You guys know David, yeah. yeah. So um, David was rocking it out in Poppenburg, Germany, um, a week ago Friday, when we uh, named our new AIDA ship, AIDA Nova, which is the first totally powered LNG ship. And um, so for us, you know, that's a real fundamental change. We're not all in on LNG yet, to be honest with you. We've got to get the supply right and so on around the world in distribution. And the one thing about our business is our assets are mobile. So that's why we can manage in all these environments. If we were a hotel, that stuff I was talking about, about places being you can't go, that would be really bad, right? Because you can't move the hotel. But we can move the ships. When you go to LNG, you got to be able to move the ship. Now, we can go to alternative fuel because it burns, you know, MGO and LNG. But then your costs go way up, and that restricts you, too, on which itineraries you can do. So we got to pay attention to all that. But that, the, what's new for us is experience. Now, the biggest new thing is experience-based, and it's ocean. So we'll see, it's the, one of the biggest IOT efforts on the planet, Internet of Things efforts on the planet. We got about 27 patents filed. Um, what it is, is that little medallion you saw in the slide. Um, if you take it, uh, you put it in your pocket, wear it on a wrist, put it on your necklace, on a necklace or whatever. Um, it does everything, but most importantly, it's like a license plate, so it identifies you. So eventually, if you order something, say you're on Lido deck, all you guys cruise. So if you're on Lido deck and you order something, you want to go down to the casino, the drink or food will find you. Mm -hmm. Okay? Or you order at a bar, you walk up, they know your name, they know you by name, <coughs> they know what you order and what you like, okay? And they'll say, hey, I saw you like Bloody Marys, we got this special vodka, you want to try one or not, you know, whatever, you know. And you say, oh, I love it. And then you're on Alaska, there's a whale off the ship of the bow. Um, off the, uh, off the, yeah, the bow, and you, you want to run out and see the whale with everybody, you go out, the drink will come to you mm -hmm. while you're looking at it. So it opens your cabin door, you don't need to fish for anything. You go in and out of the retail, you don't need to swipe anything. You know, you know, you, you, so it's really easy, it's great for the crew, it's great for you. You have kids, you go to any portal, you don't need anything, you don't have to have a phone or anything. If you want to put it on your phone, you can, but you don't have to have anything. There's portals all over the ship. You walk up to the portal, it recognizes the portal, will put you up, and if you put your kids on it, all your kids will show you exactly on the ship where they are. And so, so the idea is exceed guest expectations. Make things frictionless, make it easy, and, and in the end, it's <coughs> like your phone. Totally personalized. Each of you have a phone. Same basic technology. But each one of you, you know your phone. It's got your screen savers, your apps, it's, got, it's you. The idea is to make travel personalized to you as an individual. So your travel experience feels like it's customized just for you. And that's what the technology makes possible. But we gotta play it out and see how it goes. It's brand new technology, we'll see. So. Last question. We've got a lot of students in yes. the uh, audience. 
Students, uh, put your hands up. Let's uh, give our students hey. a round of applause. Yeah. Okay. So, um, looking back to your own early days, yeah. two or three words of advice for our uh, students here in terms of how to become principal leaders like you. Ah, okay, I don't know about like me, but here's what I would say. Um, you don't want to be like me. Uh, the, <laughs> look, find your passion, okay? You don't have to know it, but be in constant pursuit of it. So find your passion and then live it. Because no matter what you choose to do, there's junk that goes with it, okay? Um, I don't care if it's playing golf, getting married, whatever it is, there's, there's junk that goes with it. If it's your passion, the crap and the junk, you just manage through it, it doesn't bother you. And, and you, you get through it all. If it's not your passion, it will pull you down and you will not be happy. And in the end, you know, life is about being productive in a way that makes you happy. And so find your passion and pursue it, that's number one. Number two, if you're gonna go into business, all you business students, um, you gotta know your numbers, okay? Um, rare exceptions, there are people who know nothing about numbers that made a gazillion dollars. You can take that crap shoot if you want, but I recommend against it. So know your numbers, okay? Because business is business. And in the end, it's not in the end only about the numbers, but the numbers give you the freedom to operate. You gotta really understand your numbers. So that'd be the only other thing I would tell you from a business. And then the last thing is, it's all about people. You know, companies are just a bunch of people running around, you know? People always, uh, people kind of hold up, you know, some people hold up big companies, little companies. It's just us, it's just people. We make it all up. Art charts, all that, and we just make all this stuff up. So, in the end, it's about the people. And so, make sure that, you know, you relate to people, you respect them, you respect the people around you who look out for you, and that you stay humble. That, you know, you, know, you ain't all that. You know, I ain't all this or whatever you think I am. You know, I'm just a human being. And in the end, if you respect people and respect everybody, even the people trying to backstab you, okay, don't stoop to their level, all right? And that's gonna happen. People are gonna say stuff about you, it's not true, and so they're gonna, it happens all the time. Don't give in to it, don't lose your focus, just don't. Just respect everybody and learn what you can from everybody. And, and if you follow that, you'll, you'll be fine. In fact, you'll probably be better than fine because most people have a hard time doing that. Thank you. 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 Thank you.